Uh, so we're going to be looking at Psalm 104 this evening. Psalm 104, if you look there uh, with me this evening, and uh, this psalm is 35 verses, so I, I figure I'll take five minutes per verse, and uh, did you hear what I did there? I said perverse. <laughs> Oh, I saw Nate, and I thought perverse. Anyway, uh, but uh, but it'll take about five minutes perverse, and we will be here a long, long time, right? That would that would be a long study. But now we want to move through this. Uh, I, I will try to move quickly, without taking too long. Yet at the same time, there's some things in here we want to get, and so we don't want to just skip over without taking time to enjoy the richness of this. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on this study tonight. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this psalm that we're looking at tonight. Lord, thank you for the beauty of all of them. 103 psalms, Lord, have been a beautiful reflection of your love and your holiness and your grace and your kindness, your goodness, your mercy. Lord, your, your righteousness. And Lord, just uh, the, the prophetic picture we have seen of your son Jesus, Lord, your gospel plan your plan of redemption, your plan to wrap up everything going on in human history. So many think they're in charge, but Lord, you are. You're on the throne, and we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you that you're still God and you still reign. We lay our lives before you, and we trust you today. We ask you to bless the study of this psalm. Lord, uh, look past this stammering, stuttering teacher and allow your words to come forth. You be our teacher tonight, we pray. Let your Holy Spirit be our teacher. Father, that we may learn, that we may be drawn closer to you that we may be led more uh, thoroughly and more, and more effectively in your will. And we pray it, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So this, this psalm starts out very much similar, very much the same as our psalm last week. Psalm 103 started out. Uh, it said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. He starts out uh, kind of the opposite of the way people usually we're saying, Lord, oh Lord, bless my soul. <laughs> We're always asking the Lord, bless me, help me, do this for me, do that for me. But the psalmist here wants to do something. Uh, he wants to praise the Lord. He wants to pray. He wants to worship the Lord. And he wants to lift up his, his worship to the Lord in a way that's going to be pleasing to the Lord. He says, Lord, I, 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 I'm not asking you to bless me right now, Lord. I do that all the time. But Lord, I want to do something that's pleasing it's going to be a blessing to you. Bless the Lord, as he said last week, O oh my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. We need to be engaged in our worship. We need to be engaged with all our heart and all our soul, all our strength. Love the Lord and want to be a blessing. This is a good desire of the psalmist to want to be a blessing to the Lord. And he wants to be pleasing to God. And so he goes on and he begins to honor and give praise and to God, and he's worshiping the Lord with the sound of his voice. In verse 1, he continues, he says, O Lord my God, you are very great. Like, I don't think anybody's ever told me, you are great. I've heard some people tell me, you're okay. <laughs> but uh, you are great, he says. Lord, O oh, oh Lord my God, you are not just great, you are very great great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. And just think about that statement for a second. You are clothed with honor and majesty. How many times in the scripture do we run across little places where good and righteousness is spoken of like a spiritual kind of a, of a clothing? But sin and wickedness is spoken of like a spiritual kind of nakedness of which we should be ashamed. And we see that in the scripture. Remember Genesis chapter 3, as early as the fall. Genesis chapter 3, uh, the Bible says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate, and then the Bible says what? Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. In sin, they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves 
coverings. Of course, we know then the Lord in verse 21 made them coats of skins, tunics of, of, of animals, uh, coats of skins to cover the shame of their nakedness. He, nakedness. he clothed them. Revelation chapter 3, the uh, message to the church at Laodicea. The Lord says, Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and naked. He says, uh, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Uh, Proverbs 31, I think about in Proverbs 31, it speaks of the, of the godly virtuous woman. I think about my mother and it says there in Proverbs 31, she girds herself. I mean, she, she, she dresses herself with strength. She girds herself with strength. Proverbs 31, 25 says, strength and honor are her clothing. And, and so we see that in the Word of God. Uh, in the book of Revelation 19, you go all the way down to the end. We looked at the beginning. We saw a man's spiritual nakedness when he sinned. But we go to the end of the book after God has done His work, after God has done His redemptive plan, and we go to the end of the Bible, Revelation 19, verse 7, and we hear the words, Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness, the righteous acts of the saints. And so understand throughout the Scripture, sin and wickedness is spoken of, equated with being spiritually naked. But good and righteousness is equated with being clothed in robes of righteousness, which comes from Christ. And what does the psalmist say to the Lord here? What does he say to our Lord here in verse 1? He says, you are clothed. Just like the godly woman, was, she clothed herself with strength and honor. He says to the Lord, you are clothed with honor and majesty. And you know what else? Light. Light, he says in, in verse 2. He says, you cover yourself with light as a garment. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, strength, with, clothed with honor and majesty. Majesty of a king, glory of a ruling king. And, and you cover yourself with light as a garment. That light is brighter than the sun. Too bright for us to even look upon. God is clothed in that light. And so this begins with high praise. Just about, I came in tonight and somebody says, I like that shirt, it looks good on you. Right? <laughs> but this is much bigger, right? Okay. They said, I like the little fish. They said, uh, I like that shirt. There's something fishy about it. <laughs> but... Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Wow. But uh, this is much bigger. The Lord is clothed with majesty and honor and light. He's been praised for, what the, for his character which clothes him. Uh, and and this, is, this is wonderful. And, and the psalmist is going to move on here. And he's going to, he's going to be speaking. He's going to be speaking of the mighty power of, of the Lord, and uh, he's going to be talking about how that power has been made evident through creation. We see creation is a big thing in this passage. And a lot of people will read this psalm and they will liken it unto Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis 2, the account of the creation. We can do that and we can learn much and we can be blessed by that. But we can also liken this to the gospel of John in many ways, and we're going to do that as well, because Christ was present in creation just as well as the Father. And so I want to talk about our Lord in uh, creation and, and, and how the psalmist talks about that tonight. So look in verse 2, second part of verse number 2. He says he's talked about what he's clothed in, majesty, honor, Light And now he says, you stretch, he talks about not just the way he's clothed, his, his, the beautiful character he's clothed with, clothed with, 
but he talks about his ability. He says, you stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Now, the heavens that we're talking about here, not just the, there's, we hear about Paul even said, I know a man once, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, who was caught up into the third heaven. And we've heard people say, what are, what are the thir third, what's the third heaven? Well, there's, you look up and you see the sky. You know, that's the, that, the Bible refers to that as the heavens. And then beyond that sky, out past the earth's atmosphere, are the heavens, the space, the cosmos out there are the heavens. And then there's the heaven that is God's abode where God lives. That's the third heaven. That is, that is the heaven that we understand. There's, there's the, the heaven we look up and see the sky, the heavens that we, very few human beings have even begun to scrape the surface of, of, of going out into, but the, uh, the heaven where God lives. But we're talking about space here, or even maybe just the sky, maybe even just the sky that, that we can look up and see. And it says, you stretch out the heavens like a curtain. And I want you to just think about the magnitude of that statement, to that he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. How many of you, and the Bible talks to us plainly, right? How many of you have ever hung a curtain up? Yeah. Most of you men have done this for your wives. Most of you ladies have gone back and done it right after your husbands did it for you. But uh, it stretched out a curtain. It's, it's not a difficult or very difficult task for us, right, to, to put a curtain up over a window. Uh, we may have to get a step ladder because we can't do it from the ground. It may be too high. We may have to have somebody standing behind us to tell us if we got it straight or we need to pull it in a certain direction. But it's not a, a difficult task. Depending on the size of curtain it is, we have one that goes all the way across our living room because there's four windows right together. And, and that's a little more work, you know, to, to stretch out a curtain across that. And me and my wife have got in some heated lightsaber duels over that, you know, and it's uh, sometimes uh, the bigger the curtain is. But think about the, in the heavens. He stretched out the heavens. But he, did to, but he did it in such a way with his power and his great ability and his wisdom like a curtain. It, like, it would be like us hanging a curtain is what it took for God to stretch out the heavens. There's a little bit of scientific um, uh, truth in this as well that uh, people talk about if, if this applies to the space, you know, he stretches. And we find that in the book of Job. It says he stretches out the heavens. Did you know that, uh, the, that scientists believe that the universe is still expanding? It's still expanding. And the Bible says he stretches out the heavens. And so uh, it's just kind of an extra. Y'all can add it to my check at the end of the week. But, uh, but God... Is, is mighty. He stretches out the heavens like it would be for us to hang a curtain. We, we can't even begin to imagine the vastness of this universe, the, of space, of the cosmos. We can't even begin to imagine where, I mean, I get wore out on a little road trip up to Amarillo, you know. I can't imagine exploring a five-year mission, <laughs> you know. We just know. It, it's just too much to even, even think about. But God just put it up there, put it out there. He spoke and, and he put it out there. And it was, it's such a simple thing for him. But the psalmist is going to take us deeper into this. And he's going to make three statements here in verse 3. Three statements that are just amazing. He says in, at the beginning of verse 3, first he says, He lays the beams of his upper chambers. Where? On the waters. On the waters. Okay, now, if you're building, which I imagine the, the building where God's going to live is going to be massive, right? He, he, he lays the beams of his upper chambers on the waters. Now, if you're going to build a building, where do you lay the beams for the foundation? Do you lay them on the water? Are, are you going to be able to build a building on that? Okay, we can't, it, would, it would sink. You know, you, you, you'd sink from the beginning, right? Upon the waters. He lays it on the waters, and we don't exactly know exactly what he's talking about, but, but we're talking about something here that God does, and we, in the context with the rest of the other things he says, it just, it just fits together. He's talking about he does this, he accomplishes what he accomplishes, 
and it's beyond what we can accomplish. He does it, and it's something we can't do. Uh, he, he goes on. He says in verse 3, he says, He makes the clouds his chariot. Okay? You heard that song, uh, These Are the Days of Elijah? Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, right? And he's going to return in the clouds of heaven. And he came down to Mount Sinai, and he was encircled in that thick, dark cloud. He was veiled in that thick, dark cloud. He rides on the clouds as, like a chariot. Can you ride a cloud like a chariot? Mm -hmm. Give it a try. <laughs> Give it a try. But, you know, I, I went through one one time in an airplane. We were flying up, and we went through a cloud. Uh, but I, I, I pretty much had that suspicion that it was just kind of fog up in there in the air. And if I were to try to step out on it, you know, it looked pretty cool. I think I would go down. I don't think it would hold my weight up. <laughs> Those little vapor droplets. No, it wouldn't work. Uh, but the Lord is able to do this that we're not able to do. He rides the clouds like a chariot. And then it says he walks on the wings of the wind. Well, he can walk on water, can't he? And so why wouldn't he be able to walk on the wind? Can you walk on the wind? Nice. Are you going to claim? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew this was going to... I knew we were going down a bad road here. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. But, uh, but all these things, everything we see here are things that we can't do, but God can do. And, and it's, it's just amazing. So we're praising God. We're talking about how great and mighty He is. Talking about all these mighty things He can do that we can't do, which points us, though, as we, as we come here. This, we, we come to a place here now that points us right to the heart of this psalm. Okay, I haven't got to the, to the heart yet. The heart of this psalm is beginning in verse 4. Who makes His angels spirits, His ministers of flame, of fire. Now, angels are, are mighty beings, right? Uh, one angel can defeat an entire army. We've read about that in the scripture, right? They are mighty. They move very quickly. But the Lord makes them ministers, ministering spirits, okay? He makes them to serve himself, to go about his business and, and do what he bids them do. He is, they are mighty. He is mightier. They are, they are mighty. He is the master of these mighty angels, okay? He is the Lord of hosts, okay? And, and, and we see here he makes his, his, his angels, spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Now, if, if that verse sounds familiar, if those words sound familiar, it's, it's probably because you probably heard it when you were reading through the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, okay? And, and that's why I say that this points us to the heart of, of this psalm. And Hebrews chapter 1 quotes these words here, where it says, He makes His angel spirits, His ministers of flaming, a flame of fire. This, he quotes these words in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7. The thing that's significant about that is that in Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews is teaching us about how, you know, angels are pretty powerful. Angels are pretty, pretty cool dudes, okay? But the writer of Hebrews is teaching us about how Christ is higher and far better than the angelic beings. He is far better. He says, to which of them, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my beloved son? To which of the angels did he say, you come, you sit here while I make your enemies your footstool? He's, he's talking about how Christ, how Christ is better. And in this particular scripture of Psalm that uh, the, the writer of Hebrews quotes here. What he is saying is he has made the angels his servants, but he has said to Christ, he says, he, he calls him Lord. He calls him Lord. He's made them ministering spirits, but in Hebrews 1, he says, here's what he says to Christ. He says to them, you guys are my servants. But he says to Christ, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So that's the, that's the message. Christ is much higher, much better than the angels. And this helps point us now, as I said, toward the heart of this psalm. For, uh, you see, it's Christ who is at the heart of Psalm 104. Like we said, if you're ever studying a psalm and 
you know, you can see some things, but you're really trying to get to, down to the truth of it. Just try to put Christ in, in, into that psalm and try to understand it in light of what it's telling us about Christ, what it's teaching us about Christ, or, or, or what we can learn that we know about Christ in that psalm. And that's what we see here. We're going to see that as we move through this psalm. We can, we, we can take this psalm and we can compare it to Genesis, and we can know God created all these things, and God is in control of all these things. We, we can talk about creation, and we can, we can learn from that, and it'll be a great experience for us. But if we want a deeper experience, we also take it and we compare it to the New Testament. We compare it to things we know about Christ. And tonight I've, I've kind of set my heart on the Gospel of John. And if you notice probably in the title, we talk about the great I Am. And He's sovereign over creation. He is the great I Am. That's what, of course, when, when uh, Moses asked the Lord, who do I say sent me when he went to Pharaoh? He said, you tell them that I Am has sent you. You tell them that I Am has sent you. And of course, when Christ was here, He began to call Himself by that name quite often, I Am. If we really want to get the full experience of what this psalm offers us, we want to deeply understand it, uh, what this psalm means, then we, we're also going to compare it to what we know in the New Testament. So let me give you a few things here in this psalm that we're going to learn tonight. Number one, Christ's participation in creation. Christ's participation in creation. And look at verse 5. He says, You who laid the foundations of the earth. The psalmist is praising the Lord. He says, You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. And so it's clear here when the scripture speaks of the foundations of the earth, it's talking about creation. When creation began to be built, you start with a foundation. And he's talking about he who laid the foundations of the earth. And so you might ask, what, what does Jesus have to do with creation? We don't hear about Jesus till we get to the New Testament. And I would answer no, rather we hear about Jesus all the way through the Bible from the very beginning all the way to the very end. And he has everything to do with creation. And if you look at the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it has an in the beginning, just like Genesis has an in the beginning. Genesis 1.1 says in the beginning. John 1.1 says in the beginning. And John 1.1 says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So nothing created on this planet that Christ did not create. He has everything to do with creation. Everything that exists was created by Him. Also, Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John to the Jews who were, after He said this, would take up stones and want to put Him to death. In John chapter 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And so he's referring to himself as divine. And so he participated in his creation. As much as the Father was involved in cre creation, Christ was involved in creation. So secondly, I want you to see Christ's punishment of creation. We also see this in Genesis, Genesis chapter 6. What's the story there? In Genesis 6. Yeah. Guy named Noah. <laughs> yeah, and God God poured out his punishment, he poured out his wrath, poured out a flood on the planet. Well, tonight we we look secondly at Christ's punishment of creation in verse number 6 of this psalm, Psalm 104:6 says, you covered it with the deep. And that word, the deep, it's speaking of the waters, the oceans that the earth has been covered with. It says, you covered it with the deep as with a garment, the waters stood above the mountains. And so when the, the deep covered the mountains, we're speaking about the flood that God sent on the earth in Genesis 6 to judge the world and to, to remove and destroy the wicked from off the face of the earth when the Lord had uh, grace and Noah found grace in his eyes and eight souls were saved, whereas by water. And so uh, you may ask, well, what did Jesus have to do with the flood? Well, according to what he told us in John, the Gospel of John in chapter 5, he had every bit as much 
to do with the flood as his father had to do with the flood. In John chapter 5, he says to the Pharisees, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And so Jesus says, I do exactly what my Father does. I don't do anything different from what he does. We do the same things. What the Father does, I do exactly. Plus, uh, Jesus went on to say in John 5 and 22, he said, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Jesus said that. Uh, this is one of those passages where C.S. Lewis read it and said he's either a liar or a lunatic or he's Lord. You have to make your decision here because if Jesus is claiming, I and my Father are one, we do exactly the same things. And when you stand in the judgment, I'm the one you're going to be standing in front of. That's what Jesus is saying here. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son. He's saying, I'm the God that's going to judge. And so either he's lying or he's just crazy or he's just flat out telling the truth. And you've got to decide which one you believe. And I believe he's Lord. I believe he's, he's Lord. So if all judgment has been committed to the Son, then Christ had to be the one that poured out that judgment when the world was flooded back in the book of Genesis. So thirdly, um, we see Christ's provision for creation. In verse number uh, 6, it says, The waters stood above the mountains, right? It was, it was flooded. Then it says, so it turns it around. It says, at your rebuke, they fled. Those waters fled away when the Lord told them the waters to leave. At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place where you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. And so not only did Christ send the flood to judge the world, to judge the wicked, but he also caused the waters to recede and flow into all the places on this earth where they should be. And he's the one who's established it so that the world would not be destroyed with a flood ever again, according and in an agreement with his father's co with God's covenant that he would never do that again. Christ did this. But uh, now watch as he goes on, verse 10, he says, he sends the springs into the valleys, they flow among the hills, they give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst, by them the birds of the heavens have their home, they sing among the branches, he waters the hills from the upper chambers, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of your own works. And so do you kind of see what's going on here? The Lord used water, a flood of waters to judge the world, but now he, he turns that around and he uses a flood of waters to bless the world and to sustain life, to give what's needed to all the creatures on this earth. And the, the creatures come and they live around those rivers that the Lord has put out there. And it's, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a beautiful thought how the Lord does this. It's the, the, at the heart of this truth is that this is Christ's mercy. You remember when the Israelites left Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea, but then that same sea came down and destroyed Pharaoh's army. And Pharaoh's uh, army was killed at the bottom of the Red Sea. But there in the wilderness, the Israelites grew thirsty, and they cried out, and they complained, and they murmured, and uh, they were thirsty. And so what did the Lord tell Moses to do? Take your staff and do what to the rock? Strike it. Smite it. Strike that rock. And so Moses struck that rock, and what happened? Water began to gush out. Water began to flow out. And it became a river that went out and followed the Israelites as they journeyed through the wilderness so that they had water to drink. The Lord supplied that. Water came flowing out of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What does Paul say about that rock? It says, that rock was Christ. That rock, that spiritual rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. You think about that. Just, just like Moses struck that rock and the water gushed out. Christ on the cross, he was struck. He was smitten for our transgressions. And the water of life flowed out and gave us life. Gave us life. And that's why 
Moses would never told to strike the rock again. He struck it the second time, and that was, that was why it was so wrong. Because Christ didn't need to be smitten twice for our sins. He suffered once for our sins. And it just makes sense that he shouldn't be smitten again. And so that's why Moses, in his anger, smote the rock, and he was wrong for it. You remember what Jesus said about himself in John chapter 3 and verse 37. He said, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Christ is the water of life. And listen to what the psalmist goes on to say here in verse 14. It says, he causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the vegetation for the service of men, that he may bring forth food from the earth. Isn't it amazing all that the Lord does to take care of us, to give us everything we need? We could, uh, we could camp out on that. It would be a great lesson. It would be a wonderful thing for us to think about. But there's something deeper here that the psalmist is going to take us prophetically deeper here. And this is going to bring us to a fourth point in this study. And that is Christ's presence among creation. Not only did Christ from the heavens care for us, but Christ came down here among us. What does it say in John chapter 1 and verse 14? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at verse 15. All that water comes down and it, it, and it, from the Lord it causes the grass to grow for the cattle, for the vegetation service of man. He may bring food from the earth. And then it goes on and says, And wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Now, you listen to that and you think, does that ring any New Testament bells for you? Wine, oil, bread. You think about that. I mean, God, I don't think there's anything here by accident. I think there's something beautiful. <laughs> the Lord's Supper. Uh, there, there's, something, there's something wonderful. It, it just First, we see, we see the Lord blesses us with water, with, all, with what we need to nourish and sustain the earth. But now we see the blessing of the wine. What did Jesus do at that wedding? Feast in Cana of Galilee. Turn the water into wine, right? And so it made it a very interesting wedding after that, right? Uh, yeah. He turned the water into wine. And I think it was symbolic of the new covenant. No more the, the washing of the Old Testament law, but the, the, the wine and the precious blood of the new covenant, which is far better. Turn the water into wine. And what did Jesus tell his disciples as they were gathered around that table on the night before he died on the cross? Matthew chapter 26. He says, drink this, all of you. Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We're talking about the precious blood that flowed through Christ's veins. It was poured out for us at Calvary. It washes us clean from every sin. But notice we also have the bread. What did Jesus say about himself in John 6, 35? I am the bread of life. He who comes uh, to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And don't forget what he said to his disciples at that last supper. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. For do this in remembrance of me. And then don't forget, we also have the olive oil. Olive oil. We remember the words of David from the 23rd Psalm. Thou anointest my head with the oil. My cup runneth over. Back in the Old Testament, the prophets, Samuel or Nathan, they would take oil and they would anoint the person that the Lord had chosen to be the next king of Israel. And even into the New Testament, we're taught for a person who's sick and ask the elders for prayer and let them pray for them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. 
And what does the name of Christ mean? The, the, the very name of Christ means the anointed one. Or he's our anointed king of, of kings. He, he's our anointed king. In, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4 is a very uh, interesting story. Uh, uh, and, and it involves a man named Zerubbabel who was really in the royal line. Had, had Israel not gone so rogue in their sinful behavior, he might have been king at one time. But instead... He just kind of became a lowly governor. And uh, to him and his lap fell the very difficult job after Israel came back from the captivity. He led them in the rebuilding of the city and the rebuilding of the temple. And the thing that was tough about it, he was very discouraged because Israel was not the easiest group in the world to lead. And they complained a lot. And, they, they, and, and one of the things that was very discouraging, you know, is that uh, when they laid the foundation of the temple, you know, you had a bunch of young people who were so excited. They said, this is, this is the greatest thing, you know, and they were shouting for joy. But then you had an older generation. They said, man, this ain't as good as the old one. And so they were, they were all gripping about it. And, and, and the, 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 joyful, the joyful celebration was so loud. But then the angry, bitter complaining was so loud that you couldn't tell what was going on. It was very discouraging. But, you know, Zerubbabel was a discouraged guy because he had this difficult job. And so the Lord gave Zechariah the prophet a vision. And in that vision, he showed him a, a golden candlestick, Zechariah chapter 4. It had a bowl on it and it had two olive trees and some tubes going out from the bowl that fed all those candles, those lights and the lamps and the candlestick. And... Uh, Zechariah didn't understand what it was, you know. And so he asked, there's an angel, they're speaking with him, and he says, what is this? And he said, you don't know. And so he says, well, here's the message for Zechariah. Here's, here's the message that the Lord has, and, and he wants you to give this message to Zerubbabel. Zechariah 4 and verse 6, he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You can't do this, Zerubbabel, on your own. But if you have the Holy Spirit, if you have the power of the Spirit of God, and we say we can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord made clear to Zerubbabel, <laughs> Zerubbabel, to Zerubbabel, <laughs> what's his name? He made it clear to him that with the power of the Holy Spirit, he would, he would say that he would move mountains out of the way and make them a plain. He says, you shall become a plain before Zerubbabel. And he's going to finish the work that God gave him to do. And the oil is a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit, which, remember, who made that promise to his disciples before he went to die? He said, you're going to have great sorrow. You're going to be sorrowful. But then you're going to, your sorrow is going to turn to joy. He said, if I don't go away, I can't send who? The Comforter, right? I can't send the Spirit when He comes, uh, you know. And, and that's the promise the Lord made. I'm going to send the Spirit. And so it was Christ who made that promise. Fifthly, Christ's power over creation. So I'm just going to kind of read ahead here because we're getting short on time. But I'm going to go ahead and read ahead a little bit. It says, uh, it, it just describes some of these mighty things God has done. It says, the trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he planted. You ever think about that? I said I was just going to read ahead, but <laughs> that God made all these trees. And there's an old song that says it. It's been sung here in this church. It's been sung in other church. He grew the tree that he knew would be used to make the old rugged cross. You know, he, God... Let that little seed go into the ground and, and, and grow into a tree that would, where his son would be nailed to a cross. And that's an amazing thought. Uh, God has put these trees, he's made them healthy. The cedars of Lebanon, which he planted, where the birds make their, their nests. They're, not, they're a blessing uh, where the birds can live. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are, are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. Uh, you make darkness and it is night in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar 
after their prey and they seek their food from God. The young lions seek their food from God. God does all this for them. He provides all this from them, for them. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. The, they, the lions go out at night and then in the day, in the day when the, when the sun rises, they gather together, they get in their dens. Man goes out to his work and labors until the evening. Oh Lord, how manifold. I was thinking about this when we were singing that song because it had the word manifold in it. And I was thinking about a car that has a manifold. It just means a lot. How many? So many. How manifold are your works in wisdom. You have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are the innumerable teemings of things, living things, both small and great. There are the ships uh, sail about. There is Leviathan, which you have made to play there. Of course, Leviathan, um, we read about him in Job. We talked about Leviathan in Job. He's clearly a very large sea creature that sometimes made his way out on the land because they described the trail that he left behind. Uh, but far too big, far too powerful. His scales are too thick for man to be able to uh, capture him or tame him or defeat him. But our psalmist tells us here, God just put that big creature out there to play in the ocean. And that kind of gives me the impression uh, that Leviathan, who's mighty to us more than we can handle, just kind of like a goldfish in a bowl to the Lord. He's so mighty and so awesome. Verse 27, he says, These all wait for you. All the creatures, everything, they all wait for who? For God. They depend on the Lord. That you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they're filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. That's pretty interesting. And you see, these, these creatures that are too much for man to handle because they're so big, they're, they're just like a little pet to God. But God provides what they need. They depend on Him. And as big as they are, they all look to the Lord. They all depend upon the Lord. And they'll all always need Him. And it's going to bring us to our final point. Christ's perfection of creation. It's coming a time when he's going to perfect it. And we've just read here in uh, verse uh, 29. We've just read where it says, if you take away their breath, they die and return to where? The dust. Um, but here in verse 30, it says, you send forth your spirit they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Now you, you listen to that. that. That is a prophetic verse of Scripture right there. And it points us to the Lord's return. Uh, isn't it what the Word of God tells us that God is going to do? Christ is going to do? What did Jesus say? John chapter 5, do not marvel uh, at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done well to the resurrection of condemnation, right? And so uh, what, did he, what did he say there? You, you know, the, if you withhold your hand, they're, if you take their breath, they're going to die. They're going to return to the dust. But you send forth your spirit. They are created and you renew the face of the earth. Daniel chapter 12. Uh, says that uh, there shall be a time of trouble uh, and uh, it'll, it'll be such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, those who are sleeping in the dust, shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. He's coming. And he's coming, Christ is coming to make us new and to make this earth new. It's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. 
And so verse 31, he says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they, and they smoke. Isn't that what happened when the Lord came down to Mount Sinai? Trembled. The mountain was filled with smoke. Isn't that what, what happened? The earth shook. And isn't that the kind of thing that's going to happen at his second coming? The earth is going to shake. The Lord's going to return. His feet are going to touch Mount Sinai. What's going to happen? That mountain is going to split in two. It's going to be a big valley. Right in the middle of that mountain. It's going to make two mountains. And that's just an amazing thing here. Verse 33 the psalmist says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. You know, I think about that. And that's what the psalmist said from the very beginning. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul. Lord, you're very great. He's already said that. He's praising the Lord again. When I think about it, I think he's got the right idea. I, I think you might as well just go ahead and praise him now. Whether you like him or not, because <laughs> whether you like it or not, he's in charge. And he's going to be in charge. And uh, so we ought to just go ahead and praise him like the psalmist is doing here. Because he is in charge. So verse 35, he says, May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Isn't that what's going to happen? Yeah. Matthew chapter 25. Going to line the sheep up on the one side and the goats on the other. He's going to say, depart from me, right? He's going to say, I never knew you. He says, these shall go away into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. All the wicked are going to depart from the earth. Sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. That's going to be the result of Christ's second coming. So here's a good conclusion, right? Just... We've already kind of seen the conclusion, but uh, back in verse 33 and 34, I'm going to sing to the Lord. Here's a good conclusion, just like we started. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord.